The United Nations is marking its 75th anniversary today, but the COVID-19 pandemic prevented the biggest diplomatic meeting from taking place, at least in the traditional way. Well, how can Africa become more influential in the United Nations and the Security Council? And what exactly will it take for the continent to shape debates and influence geopolitical deadlocks? Well, joining me now is University of Pretoria International Law Professor Dire Tladi, who is also a fellow at the Institute of Comparative and International Law in Africa. Good evening, Professor Tladi. It's a pleasure to have you on. As more countries globally continue to face internal economic turmoil, multilateralism seems to be one of the ideas and concepts that has really taken a knock and countries becoming more inward looking. The 75th anniversary is really taking place under a different global economic climate, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's correct. I think we've seen um, in the last couple of months, um, we've really been under stress. We've really been living under a shadow. Um, and life has been very different from what we normally expect. Normally in this time, um, New York would be teeming. It would be full. There'd be diplomats from all over the world, heads of state from all over the world. Um, and now, of course, it's taking place virtually. So absolutely, I think we're living in very different times and very difficult times, in fact. Of course, one of the questions that bears to mind is whether or not the United Nations remains an organization that is responsive to the immediate needs of the global society. Yeah, I mean, that's always a very difficult question. I think what we have to remember is that the United Nations is an organization of states. So in a sense, the United Nations can only go as far as states can go. So a lot of the, um, the geopolitical dynamics that sort of shape what the world looks like will also shape how far the United Nations can go. So if you're trying, for example, to get a decision um, in the General Assembly, you require a certain number of states. If you're trying to get a decision in the Security Council, you require a certain number of states plus, depending on the type of decision, um, a certain specific group of states also to support. So all of those dynamics shape what is possible within the United Nations. Um, the United Nations itself, I think we always have to remember, is a body of its members. Um, and so in a sense, it's always limited by what its members are willing to do. Is it difficult for the organization to build consensus building in the kind of climate that the world is operating in today when for a minute there it looked like everybody was reading from the same hymn book but, but things have, have changed quite drastically? I, I don't know. I, I, I think that, um, that it always depends on specific issues. Um, and so for some issues, um, it's possibly more likely to reach consensus. Um, so within the United Nations and other issues, um, it's probably more difficult. My suspicion is, and maybe this relates more specifically to your question, my suspicion is certainly on certain issues of peace and security, what we have seen is we have seen the world sort of split, if you like, into to different groups. And so on specific issues of peace and security, it becomes a lot more difficult um, to reach agreement within the UN Security Council. But what we do see, um, we see that um, within the General Assembly, where you don't have similar kinds of dynamics, um, it's easier to reach decisions. I mean, I'll give you just one example. Um, a few months ago, um, just at the beginning of um, the COVID pandemic, the UN Secretary General had proposed um, um, that there should be a ceasefire um, because of um, the pandemic. Now, obviously, this would first go to um, the UN Security Council, and it was very difficult at that point to arrive at a decision whereas the General Assembly was very quickly able to arrive at a minute decision. Um, the UN Security Council subsequently did arrive at a sort of a, a slightly more watered decision calling for um, a universal ceasefire. But so again, it's dynamics. Um, in one organ of the United Nations, it's easier to arrive at a decision again because of the dynamics. In another organ, it's perhaps not so difficult because they're different dynamics. 
um, that, that are applicable there. Of course, perceptions around whose <coughs> interests the institution is acting on behalf of um, also influence how conversations go. Do you think that the petition to expand the mandate or uh, the roles of the Security Council and include more seats, especially seats that are representative of uh, countries in your so-called South, do you think that there, there's any movement on that debate? See, I, I have to tell you, in my previous life as a diplomat, I used to be a diplomat for South Africa stationed in, in New York. This used to be, in fact, one of my files. One of the issues I used to deal with was the UN Security Council reform. And one of the jokes I would crash, uh, make at our morning meetings was that I suspect if any of my children ever became diplomats, they would be dealing with this very same issue. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is I just cannot see how, again, in light of dynamics, and there's a lot of different things that make it difficult to arrive at a decision to um, reform the United Nations Security Council, it's, it's very difficult for me to see sort of how that's possible. Um, I, I haven't looked at this file since I left New York in 2012, 2013, um, but very quickly in preparation for this, I went just to see what was happening and we are exactly where we were um, in 2012, um, in 2013. So it's, it, it's very difficult to see the possibilities for uh, um, an outcome um, as far as UN Security Council reform in, is concerned. In, in, in the absence of that, however, are we seeing that issues that predominantly concern countries are in, in the so-called developing world are being given prominence as issues of discussion uh, within the United Nations General Assembly and that those conversations are not necessarily taking place in, within a framework that seeks to say, you know, developing countries are worse off than perhaps uh, some of their more developed counterparts and that they're really there to learn the lessons and they must shut up and listen to what the big boys in the room have to say. So let me answer your question in, in two parts and say that as far as the General Assembly is concerned, I think you're... So you're absolutely right. There's obviously more room for discussion. There's always a question, though, about whether um, these discussions and even the outcomes in the General Assembly will bear the type of um, real fruit, tangible fruit, um, and if you like, um, so, so that's anticipated. It's one thing if you have a resolution that's passed in the General Assembly with the support overwhelmingly of developing um, states, but without the support of um, developed states that requires a cooperation of the developed states, it's a question mark over whether or not that can really bear fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, the resolutions themselves aren't binding. So um, to the extent that you require cooperation from the developed states, you would hope that they would join in the consensus so that the decisions <clears throat> themselves would be implemented. Um, as far as the Security Council is concerned, so one of the things that's interesting is that um, by far, the majority of the issues that are being discussed, um, even at the Security Council, affect developing countries. Um, but to your point, the question is to what extent um, are developing countries and those countries that are directly affected by those discussions, to what extent do they have an equal voice in sort of um, um, making sure that the decisions that, that are produced by the UN Security Council are um, um, are positive decisions for developing countries. And that's a, so that remains a question mark. Has having somebody like Donald Trump as the president of the U.S. changed the tone in which things are done within the framework of, of the United Nations? We know that the U.S., of course, is a central figure uh, when it comes to bodies like the U.N. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I... I my view has always been that as far as um, international relations is concerned, and of course now this is not international law, this is international relations, which is very closely linked with international law, but my view has always been that um, um, U.S. foreign policy doesn't really change with administrations. It is, and I think you mentioned the word tone. The tone might change, but the foreign policy um, remains the same. So in terms of decision-making and the content of the decisions I mean, I'm not sure that you would uh, necessarily arrive at uh, vastly different decisions within the United Nations because of the role of the U.S., depending on um, who, who, um, um, who sits um, I'm in the White House. Um, it seems to me 
that um, th the main difference, as I said, is, is the tone and the style. So in previous administrations, for example, in the, um, the Obama administration had this phrase, we are here to listen and learn. But the reality is that having listened, the U.S. had always, in my experience, um, even when I was a different insisted on their view. So yes, they would listen, but they would insist on their view and their interests, um, whereas perhaps in the current administration, it's slightly different. It is, we are from the get-go telling you what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. So it's really a question of style, um, at least um, in my view, rather than a question of, of, um, um, of substance or policy. There are those, of course, who say that if the United Nations does not reform, it then brings into jeopardy the, the, the global structure and the way that the system is set up right now. Are those far-fetched ideas and theories? Are we just, you know, it, it's one thing to talk about it, but the reality of that actually happening is, is something else. I mean, the United Nations will always be there. It's, um, and so in a sense, this is a point that, 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 um, so that South Africa always used to make, uh, and I suppose it still makes it, um, that failure to reform the United Nations, and in particular the UN Security Council, um, will result in the institution losing its legitimacy, um, and if it loses its legitimacy, um, its future may be in doubt. But the reality is that the United Nations is one of those organizations from which you cannot withdraw. So it will always exist. It's a big animal and it will always exist. I think um, the only real threat to the United Nations um, uh, architecture is probably something like another major war. Yeah. Unless you have something um, um, significant happening, I think the United Nations will continue to exist. People will continue to criticize it. Um, but so what? So you criticize it, but it continues to exist. So um, um, I, I don't think the future of the United Nations is, is, um, is in question. I don't think it's in doubt. Um, I think what you will see is with the failure to reform, um, with its non-responsiveness, um, at times you will see greater criticism. But I think the United Nations will always be there. It's a big animal, and I think it will continue to exist. All right. Professor Dire Gladi, he is with the University of Pretoria. Thank you for your time on the channel tonight.